They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 9-12, Wednesday, March 23rd. This is the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News, and I want to congratulate John for winning the three-year-old Derby Fantasy Contest. Because Bill said last week he had a better chance to win that than Richmond had of beating Iowa. And they did it. No, uh, uh, get play the videotape. Hi, I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. I did not say that. I said of them winning Ooh. the NCAA. No, maybe, maybe. Oh, big maybe. difference. Uh, well, well, Bill Finley, you, you are a lightning rod as usual. And I'm using that term <laughs> almost literally based on some of the uh, responses that we got for a couple of articles you wrote that we'll talk about a little bit later. But I'm getting ahead of mm-hmm. myself. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And uh, I can't wait. Uh, you know, to to talk about the uh, the most shocking article that Bill Finley has written uh, in apparently his career, and that is about Jorge Navarro. <laughs> That's saying a lot, too. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Mark your calendars for the April Horses of Racing Age Sale, which will be after the races on closing day of the spring meet, Friday, April 29th. Entry deadline for the print catalog is April 1st. Approved supplements will be accepted until sale date. Looking forward to that spring meet. Counting down now, it's Oh, over two weeks away. Can't wait to see it. Can't wait to see all the babies out on the track. Can't wait to see the spring colors at Keeneland. And uh, can't wait to be there with you guys also. So we finally got maybe, hopefully, kind of, sort of, a conclusion to the Bob Baffert and Kentucky Horse Racing Commission saga earlier this week. Uh, the Franklin, Franklin County Administrative Law Judge, Judge Thomas Wingate, De- denied Baffert's attempt to get a stay and also Amir Zidane's attempt to get a stay of their penalties and their suspensions uh, from the Medina Spirit case. Uh, he said that they have until April 4th to try to, ap- to appeal to an appeals court judge. Uh, if that doesn't happen or if the appeal is denied, Bob Baffert will be suspended for 90 days uh, starting April, April 4th and it will go through about July 3rd. Uh, you know, it's He's going to miss triple crown season if that happens, but he'll be back plenty of time for Saratoga and Del Mar and the Breeders' Cup. So I think he'll be just about all right. But uh, what, what do you guys think? Yeah, Joe, this was a big deal. And, I, you know, I continue to be surprised by this, that he's not been able to get a stay of, of this suspension. But the court upheld the Kentucky Racing Commission. Now, there are uh, he's now going to go to the next level of court. But. And again, you have to always preface by saying this. We're not lawyers who don't really understand all the nuances of this, but it would be hard to believe that this next court is going to overrule the the Judge Wingate. Um, But this is big for a number of reasons. Not only what you said, it it may finally uh, come to a conclusion, at least the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission suspension. Remember, we still have the Churchill ban to deal with. But the the reason why this is, is, is so big to me is that because in all other cases where a guy gets suspended, we turn the barn over to our assistant. We lay on our couch and, and call in on the phone every morning and say, work glowworm for furlongs. In California, for a 90-day suspension, you cannot do that. The barn has to be dispersed. You cannot put the horses under the name of uh, uh, an assistant or any employees that work for you or for uh, under the name of a relative. So presumably one of two things would have to happen, or maybe a combination of both. The uh, a new trainer, somebody would have to come in and totally take over the operation, or every owner would have to think for themselves and go and put the horses into someone else's barn. Now, maybe he'll win on appeal, but you know, the the there has Baffert has been losing every single round of this and lately and losing big time. You know, I, I guess maybe we want to talk about this more. Maybe John has an opinion on this. Is it time for him to just you know, throw in the towel here. You would think that that at some point in time, you would say um, with all the legal fees and all of the issues that are going on and the fact that he's just not winning um, in any of these courts, whether it's at the irrespective of what level, um, that at some point you throw in the towel. But, you know, how do you make that decision? Because, you know, Baffert was basically and his attorneys were basically saying that by having to be under this suspension, it was going to cause um, irreparable harm and monetary um, issues with regard to uh, you know his business that he would have to, as Bill said, pack up his shit and 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 move on basically, and the horses would have to be dispersed. And you know, so far the to my surprise, 
you know, Baffert's owners have been very loyal. Um, very, there have been very few defections. And, and of those, they haven't been the high profile people that we originally thought, that I originally thought were, were going to be, um, you know, leaving the, the Baffert barn. Um, but you'd have to think that with this court mandate now, that uh, or excuse me, with, with, with this court decision um, based on the on, on the suspension that, uh, you know, if there is a disbursement that maybe some of these owners don't return, um, that is to be seen. I would have to think that if I had a horse personally, if I had a horse that was a derby contender and I was looking at the, the way that things were playing out at, at some point in time, I'd have to say to myself and, and to to my family who I report to. For the best of this horse, we need to move it to a place where the horse is going to be able to, to compete at the highest level at the Derby and, and at the Belmont and, and, you know, at the Naira tracks and the, and the Churchill Downs uh, family tracks. So at, at some point in time, I think you have to you know, look at it from the owner's standpoint and say enough is enough. I, I can see the writing on the wall. I need to move over um, and I can come back if, you know, if things play out differently, if I want to support my trainer. And from Bob Baffert's standpoint, I think you have to say, um, you know, how much more time, energy, um, et cetera, resources am I going to throw at this before I realize that things are stacked against me now? Um, and, and, and whether it's because of things that I've done as a trainer um, and or, you know, situations with, with the, the powers that be and also the flavor of, of the way the industry is going right now, I need to kind of do a better job of reading what's going on and maybe accept the punishment um, and 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 I'm not happy about it. I'm not going to admit guilt, but maybe I just go ahead and, and accept it and then come back um, in a few months and 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 try again. Um, the other thing that I thought was really interesting from the court, and, and I'm going to T.D. Thornton did a phenomenal job of, of in, in an article. I'm not just saying that because he's on the home team. I, I actually read the article and actually understood what it was. So obviously it was pretty easy to, 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 to delineate if I can get it. Um, but the judge came down and, and actually had a very interesting ruling, I thought. And that is, he said, you know, Bob Baffert's argument was um, that, you know, my horses are poised for the Kentucky Derby and the Triple Crown. And I am going to lose my reputation and my business if my horses aren't able to run in, the, in this year's um, big races. And the court came out and said, basically, your athletes have a finite period of of earning money, but you're a trainer and a trainer is basically a coach or a CEO. And as such, every year you get a new crop of athletes that come in. So you as the coach slash CEO don't have a shelf life. Your horses, your athletes have a shelf life. And I thought that was a very interesting distinction um, that the court made um, and, and, and allowed me to kind of think about it, uh, you know, in, in a broader sense. And I agree with that sentiment that, you know, that, that, that the trainers are the, are the, or above the athletes, and the athletes come and go. Um, they get claimed, they get hurt, they new ones come in. You go to sales, you you, you re you know you restock the the group, and, and you move forward. Um, but I thought from a legal standpoint, that was really intriguing to me. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to read that quote too, and just you know for this whole discussion, if we could just have like an arrow that's pointing to me that says "not a lawyer," I think that'd be great. <laughs> that's, we always have to have that disclaimer. Um, so the judge dismissed the argument that. First of all, that stays are automatically granted. Like they tried to make that argument that like it's usually a, a formality that the stay of the suspension is granted. Um, he said that requests should be evaluated on a case by case basis, which duh, because precedent isn't law. And he said economic harm is not irreparable harm, which was the key. And and yeah, Bob Baffert will lose some income for a few months, but he won't be irreparably damaged by that. And he has plenty of time to recoup, recoup the loss. And here's the money quote that John was referring to. It says athletes have a finite period of eligibility or peak performance. However, Baffert is not an athlete. He is a trainer, much more akin to a coach. Unlike certain athletes whose careers are subject to a small window of eligibility or period of peak performance, Baffert's career has spanned decades and will continue following this brief suspension. In fact, Brad Baffert has expressed his interest and intent to continue in his chosen profession. The horses under Baffert's care, the athletes, do possess a finite window of eligibility and peak performance. However, those horses can still race. Any harm that Baffert will suffer from not participating in the 2022 Triple Crown or other races during his period of suspension will result in only monetary loss. That made total sense to me as, again, not a lawyer. Um, and according to TD, Wingate's court has a reputation for standing up to state agencies like the KHRC, so they can't claim yet again that they got an unfair shake. So, 
basically they have 12 days, including today, um, to seek relief with the Kentucky Court of Appeals, which they haven't done as of recording, but they probably will. They're probably doing it right now as I'm speaking. Um, and if that's unsuccessful, the suspension is going to be an, begin April 4th, last until July 3rd, like I said. So he's going to miss the Triple Crown. He'll be back in plenty of time for the big summer and fall races. And life will go on. You know, Bob Baffert will still win plenty of big races until the day he stops training, which made the, the argument that a three-month suspension would be some kind of death blow to his career. It's such a joke this whole time. And you know, I'm glad the judge didn't fall for it. Yeah, Joe, that's one thing I totally agree with you on. And, you know, you understand why the lawyers say this. But, you know, when Bob Baffert's standing in the winner's circle for the 2027 Derby, uh, you know, and boy, how awkward is that going to be when he has to Bill Carstangen has to give him the trophy for that. But that's going to happen. Uh, you know, as long as he continues to produce like he does, he, this will cause damage in the short term. There's no doubt about it, it already has and will cause quite a bit of damage. Um, I mean, you know, let's be. Even though he didn't lose a lot of horses, he lost life as good over this. So, you know, he's the best horse in the country right now. But, yeah, you know, Bob Baffert is going to be fine. So, uh, you know, I understand why they say it, but I'm getting a little tired of hearing that this is going to ruin this man's career. How can you do it? Um, you know, Bob Baffert, when this is the 90 days are up, like you said, Saratoga, Del Mar, et cetera. And then, you know, presumably he'll miss the 22 and 23 Kentucky Derbies. And he's going to have five horses in the 2024 Kentucky Derby because that's who he is, Bob Baffert. And he's got, you know, he's, he's getting up in years, but he's not not, you know, at, at a point where anybody's turning away from him or anything like that. He's still tr very much in demand. Bob is going to be fine. I think the other the other interesting takeaway um, was at the very end of, of the summary uh, by, by Judge Wingate. And it talked about the fact that uh, I'm going to quote that the KHRC states that Baffert's pattern of medication positive is off the charts. And the KHRC relevant rule only contemplates penalties for trainers with up to three prior medication positives in the past 365 days. Given the amount of medication positives, plaintiffs do not present a likelihood of success on the merits. So I thought that was very interesting that, that Judge Wingate actually put into the wording of his, uh, of his review um, that it, there was a cumulative effect of all of these past positive medication, uh, medication positives and that that's why the KHRC had the ability to, to, to do this. So I know people are all up in arms about, well, whether or not Medina Spirit, you know, was really um, enhanced. His performance was enhanced because of, of what happened. But, you know, we've always said that it's not it's not a matter of that race. I mean, yeah, that was a, obviously the highest profile race we have in the industry. But it's all these other cumulative issues um, that that warranted, you know, this situation. So to me, when, when Bob Baffert comes in and his attorneys come in and say um, that this is going to ruin my career. The suspension is going to ruin my career. That's not that's not true. What's what's hurting your career is these cumulative positives that are now amassed. And it's all these little kind of one offs. It's kind of, you know, a, a death by paper cut. It's happened a bunch of times. And that's why you're in the situation you are right now. It's not about whether Medina Spirit, in my opinion, whether or not Medina Spirit had ass cream or was injected. It's all these other issues that, you know, little issues that have built up over the years. And the court actually endorsed that same sentiment. Right. I mean, that's the whole thing is that this is and once we talked about when the Medina Spirit controversies first started is that, you know, the outrage isn't necessarily about Medina Spirit and this one drug, this one drug. It's about the, the totality of Bob Baffert's record and the fact that he keeps putting himself in these positions. And John, you know, said before, you know, maybe he can just take a step back and say, you know, I screwed up. I'll take the 90 days. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that's ever going to happen with Bob Baffert. And there was a there was a brief moment in time, if you remember, uh, after after the charlatan and the uh, Gamin positives where Bob Baffert basically said, you know, I'm going to try to do a better mm -hmm. job. I'm going to hire maybe an ombudsman for my for, for my stable um, <laughs> to try to try to keep things in order. And then what happened a couple months later, Medina Spirit fails a drug test in the biggest race in the world. So I don't know why, you know, he had that brief moment of clarity that some things were his fault and he had some some, some kind of, uh, you know, housekeeping to do. But, you know, it, that turned into cancel culture and I'm being railroaded and it's a witch hunt and, and blah, blah, blah. So but like I said, this judge supposedly is usually pretty sympathetic to the trainers and even he shut them down. It reminds me of like the. The election fraud when they kept going to these Trump appointed judges and they kept mm -hmm. saying, no, there's no fraud. And that still wasn't enough. So, you know, it's like I said, life will go on if Bob Baffert has to serve this 90 day suspension and 
he'll be he'll resume training again and, and win plenty of big races. I don't think anybody needs to shed any tears for him, but hopefully, hopefully at least this this kind of this long legal you know mumbo jumbo process is over. But we'll see. Right. And, and just I know we've been getting some tweets and everything like that. So so please understand. We are not transferring stay on our good side to Bob Baffert. Just <laughs> enough. Put that to rest. The horse is not going there. Well, I mean, I'm trying to get a future bet down first. We'll see <laughs> we'll see where he ends up going, but that's that, that's my intention. Are we gonna do that horse is a Canadian bread, by the way, stay on our good side. Are we gonna do a road show for the uh, Queen's Plate? For the, for the Queen's Plate, yeah. I'm with All it. Right. We'll, we'll have to we'll have to work on that. Well, I, I know I know we're pivoting, you know, away from the Bob Baffert. But I think we're all done with that with that <laughs> with that story at this point. Um, yeah. But yeah, let's let, let's see if we can do that. I, I know that uh, probably the powers that be, the TDN, would send us up to Canada um, in Thanksgiving because it's probably really inexpensive to go up there, you know, during during uh, you know the cold weather months. But I think maybe we should push for the Queen's Plate. There you go. After that, we'll go to the. We'll just keep going further and further north. We're like the Siberian Derby next, and the <laughs> Antarctica Derby. You can see Russia from there. <laughs> the TDN Riders Room is brought to you by Keeneland. It was announced this week that tickets for the 2022 Breeders' Cup World Championships cannot wait. Hosted at Keeneland will go on sale Monday, May 9th. This will be the third year that the meet is hosted at Keeneland. Really looking forward to it. It was, it was there in 2015. We all remember the American Pharaoh Tour de Force and the Breeders' Cup Classic. And then two years ago, it's kind of the COVID-affected year. It was still a great, great event and authentic winning the Breeders' Cup Classic. You can learn more about purchasing tickets at breederscup.com slash 2022. Also, one last reminder that the entry deadline for the print catalog for the Keeneland April Horses of Racing Age sale is April 1st. So that's next Friday. Get those entries in. The sale will be held on closing day, Friday, April 29th. After the races have concluded, Keeneland sales has a proven record of success on the racetrack, and the April sale is no exception. Notable recent graduates of the April sale include grade one winner and millionaire, and now stallion, higher power. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. Racecourse is the most beautiful racetrack in America, hands down. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you to the breeding stock sale. Book one, good to have you back with us. Champion three-year-old. Maximum Security has won the TBG.com Haskell Invitational. Eleven triple-digit buyers. Maximum Security. He smoked them in the cigar mile. Grade one winning four-year-old. Maximum Security takes them all the way in the TBG Pacific Classic. Secure your mayor's future. Maximum Security. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. The Stallions at Ashford Stud are hot on the Derby Trail with Forbidden Kingdom, son of American Pharaoh, and the winner of the Grade 2 San Vicente and Grade 2 San Felipe Stakes. Missed the workout last week because of a little bit of a temperature, but I think he's still going to be able to make the Santa Anita Derby. Morello was an undefeated son of Classic Empire. I actually looked at the, uh, the sheet numbers, and Morello is right up there. Morello is like top two or three among the three-year-old Colts right now with, with his sheet numbers. Uh, so looking forward to seeing him run next. We'll see in the Wood Memorial potentially. Uh, we also had, obviously, Classic Causeway by the late Giants Causeway, winning the Tampa Bay Derby and the Sam Davis. And grade two winner, uh, Remsen winner, Mo Donical, who's the son of Uncle Mo. And I know John's got a few mares that are in full or producing foals for, by uh, Ashford Stallions, no? Yeah, both, Joe. Thanks so much. Yeah, our, our uh, grade two winning mare, uh, Art of Almost, um, just was pronounced in full to Uncle Mo on a full share with, uh, you know, with our friends at Coolmore. So we're very excited about that. We had a nice American Pharaoh cult uh, two weeks ago. And uh, another one of our mayors uh, just had a Justify Philly that we're very excited about. And I don't usually do this, but Joe, we actually are, when I went to Ireland this year and brought back some racehorses, 
Um, I partnered up with Niall Brennan on a Justify Philly, actually, that is going to be selling at the April OBS sale. It's a Justify out of the, out of the mayor, uh, Costa del Sol. And uh, she will be breezing at the OBS uh, April sale and, and selling at the OBS April sale. And I'm very, very excited to have a part of a Justify. It's the right year to have Justify. Oh, sure. yeah. And, you know, just to, just to mention that OBS April catalog came out yesterday or two days ago. And uh, we also got some notes from the OBS March sale last week relative to Kumar. American Pharaoh had a Philly sell for $1 million. She was the most expensive Philly of the sale going to Donato Lanny. And uh, first crop sire Mendelssohn, who's definitely getting a lot of buzz right now, had four six-figure horses during the second session, including a $400,000 filly selling to Jonathan Thomas. Uh, Bill actually did a story over the weekend talking to some of the the, the uh, consigners and buyers down at uh, Ocala. And there, Mendelssohn was a pretty popular pick to be the first, the leading first crop sire. So definitely got to keep an eye on him as well as the justifies. So there was a story last week reported in the TDN by our own Bill Finley that Jorge Navarro is going to jail. He got a little bit of a delay because I think he needed eye surgery before he had to report uh, to the to the low security facility that he's going to be spending the next five years or thereabouts in. Um, I don't think there could be anybody possibly in the racing world that had any sympathy still for Jorge Navarro or was a Jorge Navarro stan, as they say. But uh, I think we were proven wrong because Bill got some interesting feedback from his story. Yeah, I, I sure did, Joe. And, you know, it's funny. This was kind of a, just a straightforward story. I mean, it was just reporting that he went to jail. He's in prison in a place in Miami and, you know, how long he's going to be there for, what it's like, et cetera. And, uh, boy, you know, I didn't expect to really get in anything. And, and I want to preface this by saying if if I'm within the next couple of days struck and killed by lightning, You'll know why, okay? Because apparently, not only did I piss off somebody by the name of Vivian Hernandez, I pissed off God. Yes, I did. Anyway, so bear with us because this will be worth, this is going to take a little while, but it, it's worth reading. Dear Mr. Finley, I read your article and really I am appalled at it. That a publication like this one would print something like what you wrote really bothers me. I had horses with Jorge Navarro since he started. I have won and lost as everybody in this business. He always treated my horses with great care. And for a fact, I still have old ones retired that were under his care and they are as healthy as they can be. They are over 20 years, they are over 20 years of age. That you have so little respect for his family and kids to write all this garbage that you do not know anything about is absolutely disgraceful. I was at the track as an owner, breeder, and caretaker for over 40 years. I know a lot of people in this business, big ones that I uh, th that are unknown and trust that were unknown and trust me when I say that not only will I unsubscribe to this publication, I will call each and every person I know to do the same. So if the the um, the, the rate of, of clicks on the TDN website goes down by 50 percent, this is obviously the reason too. Um, from your writing, I can see that you have never been inside the care of the horses and you don't know anything about it. Jorge was a caring person. Yes, a caring person. And if I have read all the articles right, they only prove the case from conversations that I'm sure you and all of us have had a time in our lives that are really not even true. Yeah, me and John all talk about all the time about all the horses we drug and we just make it up because it's funny. Yeah. Um, he declared himself guilty because of the courts in this country, which are screwed up. And as you know, wanted to give him 20 years for what? What did they prove? Now, this is my favorite part, but I am not worried about you because I know that God will take care of you. And when he does, God help you for doing what you have done. What about Bob Baffert uh, and company? I never saw you writing these horrible things about him and he has killed many, many horses. Or is it that you are against Latinos or jealous of what Jorge did? Whatever it is, I am sure God will make sure you are taken care of. Vivian Hernandez. John, are you using that pen name again, Vivian Hernandez? I, I thought that was a relative of yours. And listen, Bill, there, there are a lot of articles and a lot of times that, that you know, being on the show with you, where I feel like that you're so off the rails that you should be struck by lightning. This was not one of them. This was not a case where I would say, boy, that Bill Finley, he really, really went out on a limb and, and he's just so screwed up. He's way off the, I, I can't, I mean, it, it, it blew my mind, first of all, that somebody would, would actually, in all honesty, believe that Jorge Navarro, um, you know, was good to his horses, um, you know, and, 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 and that was number one. Number two was that, you know, that you were singling out this guy. You were singling out. You were looking to for a reason to just screw over his repu his impeccable reputation as as a trainer, and that you are so racist that you would do this. And how dare you? But the funniest thing out of the article that that, that I think it, me personally I, th I took away was funny is 
as you know, I was at the track as an owner, breeder, and caretaker for 40 years. And I know a lot of people in this business, big ones, you know, and and that I'm gonna and I'm gonna unsubscribe this publication and and call each one of them and have them unsubscribe. Well, listen, Vivian Hernandez, I've also been in the business for 40 years as as an owner, and I've been on the barns and I've worked with a, with a number of trainers. And I can tell you that you are batshit crazy if you think that this guy <laughs> was good to his horses. You know, from claimer A to X Y Jet, there's no way in God's green earth, and I'll use God since you brought it up, that this guy is in prison because the court system is screwed up. It's because he admitted on you know on record and on file with the FBI, he admitted to you know taking care of these horses and drugging them, and that is why he is in jail. It's not because of the system. It's not because. Of that, that God said, "Oh well, he's too successful. I need to humble him." That has, there was no higher power in this other than the court system. So please, please call all the people you know, the big owners, the small owners, and tell them to stop listening to us because I, I don't want you as a fan. You are just so <laughs> out of your mind, crazy. And I agree with you on one thing: Bill Finley does need to be knocked down a peg occasionally. <laughs> But he does not need to be struck. That's by what this him. show is for: is to take Bill gently <laughs> the down a peg every once in a while. No, but like the funniest part is that he pled guilty. It's not like he went on trial exactly. and he lost. He pled guilty. He yeah. said these things. He said, "This is what I did right. to these horses." And if, you know, I, yeah, but Joe, come on. He was just kidding around when he said, I pumped this horse full of drugs. Right, <laughs> yeah, right, right. I look at my Crocs and I say, the juice That's man. That's all tongue in cheek. Bill was reading that, that, yeah. that very heartfelt letter to the editor. Can we just pump the juice man Crocs the whole time? Because you know, that seems to unravel any kind of sympathy that anybody should ever have for Harry Navarro. Forget all the other stuff. The I, I got to say, this is the... the in the many years I've been doing this, is absolutely the best letter I've ever gotten. It is and tremendous. And you've gotten some crazy ones, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Now, Bill, Bill, all kidding aside, like, have you gotten other, you know, letters to the editor, the responses, not on Jorge, but just on other articles you've written where you've been like, ah, hey, you know what, maybe, maybe I did make a mistake, or maybe I should think about this side of it. I, I mean, it's, some people have like legitimate criticisms, right? Not this, not, not this lady, but. Uh, I, yeah, of course. I, I mean, you listen to that, but it, it's so far removed from this craziness that, it, you know, you can't even put them in the uh, in the same sentence or whatnot. But uh, Vivian, I, I, if you're watching, keep it up. I, I mean, I'll, I'll get another. I'd love to hear from you again. This was really did Does she need my a day. green group guest of the week consultation. <laughs> That's the question. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the comment section is definitely fun sometimes, but th that, that one went uh, above and beyond. Yeah, I kind of want to transition right. out of that. You know, there's, there's no easy transition from that. Um, also, I just love that she said, like, I've never heard you say anything about Bob Baffert. Never, definitely never watched the show because I am, I, I am sick and tired of talking about Bob Baffert. And I've gotten some some angry comments in the past about things I've said about Baffert. So, you know, definitely tune into the show if you want to see us bash some other trainers because we'll do it. We'll, we ain't scared of that. Yep. yep. And and then and and white white minority like we're an equal opportunity basher. Yep. If somebody is screwing up with with our industry, I don't care you know what they look like or where they come from. We're gonna we're gonna call it out. Yeah. Well, we, although some people some people say that we don't we don't call out the the uh, you know the, the jockeys enough, which I which I also thought was hysterical. Well, and just wait until the Jason Service trial starts because we're gonna have a field day with that. If you think that we're only bashing Latino juicers. Um, right. But anyway, just moving on from that, I wanted to transition to some good news. Like, I really didn't want to spend any time on the Navarro going to prison thing until Bill got that got that letter and then that it made sense. Um, but there was some good news, you know, in the past week or two. There was a story, and this kind of goes to my point that I made in the past about how, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. When the when all the horses were breaking down at Santa Anita, front page, Washington Post, NBC, CNN, all this stuff about how the horses were dying and and uh, horse racing was such a scourge. There's a tiny story in the Pasadena Star News last week that said that the headline is California Santa, Santa Anita see huge declines in horse deaths following reforms. This is what I was talking about, that the, the good you do in that regard is never going to get reported the way the, the, the sensationalism of the, of the catastrophic breakdowns did. And I'm not saying that that should not have been reported. That was obviously a major story in, in 2019. But how about this be, could be a major story, too. It says horse racing deaths in California have been cut in half in two years and plummeted to the lowest level since 1990 as a result of reforms implemented after dozens of deaths at Santa Anita Racetrack in 2019. 
This is from the California Horse Racing Board's annual report on the state of the sport, which was released earlier this month. 72 horses died in California during the 2020-21 season that ended in June. That's down from 144 deaths from 2018 to 19, and a far cry from the 278 deaths in 2011 and 12, which was the worst year on record in the past decade. Um, at the same time, the number of horses racing has dropped only 7% in that two-year period. So it's not just that they shut down racing and you know they, they had fewer horses racing. It's, just, it's really that they have done the right things and, you know, I got to give a shout out to everybody in California who has taken this on because it was such it was such a horrible place to be in in 2019 to be that the center, the the eye of that storm. And it was a firestorm. And, you know, there there's just there's so many things that they've done, not on, only on the racing side, but on the training side, on the evaluation side. In the CHRB meeting the other day, they were talking they were talking about their their accident task force where they're trying to learn more about why horses break down and horses get injured. And they're doing a lot more, uh, a, a lot more kind of di- or pre-diagnostics, working with UC Davis to try to catch catastrophic injuries before the horses actually break down. So this is something that really should be leading and should be should be part of you know the the positive PR push that we never get in racing is this kind of news. What do you guys think? What's your reaction? Yeah, yeah, and Joe, this is terrific news, and I do agree, and I understand the media. You know, I'm not. Um, uh, saying that condoning the, the the way this has been covered because you're right it is unfair but a um, couple things um, first of all this is not just a California story um, it's a national story and if you go to the uh, injury database in 2009 the the rate of injuries the deaths were two per 1,000 starters it's now down to 1.41 now you know, is 1.41 okay? No, it's not okay because we want to get it down. I mean, we all know that it's never going to be zero, but this leads me to believe if they've made this much progress in this short a time in California, well, a couple things. First of all, let's hope that every other racing state is paying attention to what they're doing, is going to emulate what they do in California. And it, it leads to, to me, the optimism that can we get these numbers down even further? Um, and, you know, it's funny, even in um, uh, the, the story in the Pasadena Star News, uh, PETA actually had some yes. nice, fairly nice things to yeah. say about this, um, which was was pretty shocking in there, you know, kind of commending the Stronach group because, you know, everybody, uh, well, it's, it, you know, it would be also Del Mar and Golden Gate as well. But, you know, the Stronach group in Santa Anita is kind of front and center because that's where all these breakdowns occurred back in 2019. But, you know, great news. Let's keep it up and, uh, you know, let's get keep. Let's keep getting that number down every single year. Let's have this conversation this time every single year about, hey, the number went down another 20 percent and went down another 15 percent. And, you know, maybe that will happen. Well, it looks like that, that the pendulum is swinging in, in the positive direction. And, and, and it took a lot to get it there, um, to get it moving in, in, in the right direction. But certainly with the leadership of, of the Stronach Group and some of the other major racetracks um, that are actually investing money into the race surfaces, um, not only to make them you know, safer, um, you know, uh, the dirt track safer, but, you know, Gulfstream is going to tear up their turf course again this summer. Um, and it's like the second time in three years because they just feel like that it's not where they want it. Um, and they don't have to. I mean, the, people go to Florida during the wintertime to race there because of the weather and, and, and they, they really don't have to put a dime into the surface if they didn't want to. So they're, they're definitely committed to making it a safer track. Um, they implemented, a, you know, a, a multi-million dollar surface by putting in a third racetrack there. Belmont's talking about putting in an all-weather track. Um, you know, the, the the sales companies collectively got together, the ones that are selling two-year-olds, and changed um, the medication rules to make them stricter. So that way, horses that are, you know, two-year-olds that are breezing at the under-tax show have a much more stringent um, medication protocol that they have to follow. And guys, you know, when was the last time we watched a really big race day on TV and and had a and had a mishap or had a breakdown? And and when we first started the show, I remember very distinctly we had the conversation of God. I just hope all these horses finish because it's such a black eye every time a horse breaks down um, on on national television. And and knock wood, that hasn't happened in a really long time. And I think that speaks highly about. The racetracks themselves, the management, the racetrack, you know, the actual, uh, you know, physical racetrack itself, and also the pre-race protocols that you have to go through in order to get horses to run. And I, again, I know from running in some of these bigger races, it is really um, a, a, a good process you have to go through, you jump through a lot of hoops to get horses to run in the Kentucky Derby and or the Breeders' Cup. Um, I mean, literally, we had for the Breeders' Cup races, we had a vet, a different vet, look at our entries 
every single day for six days in a row. You had like literally half a dozen different vets. So it wasn't just like one person looking at the horse saying, yeah, I think you can live with it. I mean, there were six different eyeballs, sets of eyeballs that were on these horses. So I think a combination of all of those things have led to this positive uh, influence and, and made it safer for the horses. And I agree with your sentiment. I hope that we continue to have this conversation and the percentages continue to, to go in the favor of the, of the athletes. When I remember covering the 2019 Breeders' Cup out at Santa Anita, and it was just, there was just this black cloud hanging over this event, like with all the, the protests and all the negative news stories. And I remember like <laughs> watching the races and like counting the horses as they crossed the line just to make sure. And we almost got through the whole thing. And then, of course, um, we had the horse breakdown in the Breeders' Cup Classic at the very end. But, you know, there's just I we talk a lot about the, the stuff that does not get fixed and does not get even worked on in racing. You know, I do think that there are so many people, so many more people now compared to a couple of years ago who really are trying to put the, the horse's safety first. And I think that that's something to really be applauded and really, you know, you know, take hold of as something that, you know, that, that shows you that this, this sport can have a future and, and can be, you know, a, a bustling industry for years to come. And um, I, yeah, I just, I don't think there were enough people pre Santa Anita and pre the FBI indictments that really cared that much about the horse's safety. They, they just, they, they were just trying to cash the checks and kick the can down the road. Now, the only thing left to me is can we get drug reform? Can we get nationally instituted drug reform? Because that took a big blow, obviously, when USADA backed out. To me, that's the final piece because I think most, at least the major tracks are doing everything they can now to make the racetrack safer, to be better about who, who deciding who gets to run, who gets scratched. I think there's a there's so much good work being done and people have gotten their heads out of their asses in this industry. Just we just need that that universal unified drug policy in America. And, and we'll see if we're going to get it. You know, I, I don't have high hopes now, but I, I do think that that's kind of the last missing piece um, in this regard and, and, and making the horses as safe as they can possibly be. But, yeah, this is a great story. And I, I think there's a lot of people in California who do deserve a lot of kudos. Just one other thing I wanted to mention from the, the CHRB's recent meeting is that they, uh, you know, a lot of people were up in arms because there were no penalties from the whole modern games fiasco in the juvenile turf where he was scratched and then re-enter and then scratched again and then won for fun with purse money only. Uh, Express Bet and First Racing, which are, are a subsidiary of, of the Stranic Group, have now instituted um, alternates. So you can do you can do like a primary alternate and pick fours and pick fives, which should have been something that's been a, the th that's been a thing this whole time. That should have been easily easily correctable. But it's good to see um, the Strata Group and and uh, f First Bet and Express Bet taking that on. Um, I just wanted to also mention one other other good news story from this week. Uh, our our uh, associate producer, Katie Petruniak, who does a great job, not only on this show, but a great job on, on her stories and her videos. She puts out a new video basically every day. Katie's a real workhorse. She did a story this week uh, on the, the tailor-made school of horsemanship pilot program, which is something that, that takes people who are struggling with substance abuses and maybe be living in, in transition housing and lets them come out and work with horses, work on the farm. It was Frank Taylor's idea over at TaylorMade, and it seems to be working really well. And it was an interesting, there was an interesting angle to the story about how this kind of thing, if it's adopted, you know, in bigger, in, in, in bigger capacities, maybe nationwide, could help address the labor shortage, because that's something that we're dealing with in horse racing as well is, is having, not having enough people to work on the back stretches. And, and, you know, it looks like it's early days, but it looks like this program is, is helping a lot of people and also helping the industry a little bit too. So I just wanted to give a shout out to Katie and, uh, and just hope that program keeps on rolling. Cause that's, that's another good news story that we should be talking about. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. The PHBA is announcing a trainer bonus for their upcoming two-year-old stallion series, which we've talked about on the show. At the end of the four race series, bonuses totaling $50,000, a good chunk of change, will go to the trainers of the horses with the most points. Uh, for, for the trainer of the horses with the most points, first place will receive $25,000. Second will receive fifteen thousand, and third will receive ten thousand. So that's a pretty decent amount of money for those new races. All PA sired PA breads are eligible, but they must also be nominated. The early nomination deadline for the series, which starts August twenty second, is July eleventh. 
You can learn more at pabread.com. There are also several standout Pennsylvania breads at the OBS March sale, including six-figure two-year-olds by First Crop Sires, Bolt Doro, Cloud Computing, and Collected, as well as a Philly by Pennsylvania Sire, Peace and Justice, who sold for $150,000 to the homies at West Point Thoroughbreds. You can find your next Pennsylvania bread at the upcoming Facing Tipton Gulfstream sale. We'll be right back after this message from the PHBA. The PA Horse Breeders Association introduces the Pennsylvania Stallion Series. Four brand new races to be run at parks for PA sired PA bred two year olds. There are two $100,000 contests on August 22nd, PA Day at the Races. September 24th, PA Derby Day has two more races, each with a $200,000 purse. The PA Stallion Series, yet another reason why Pennsylvania is the premier place to breed and race. For more, please visit pabred.com. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Canterbury Park. That Canterbury meet opens May 18th. And now we welcome to the show the Senior Vice President of Racing Operations at Canterbury, Andrew Offerman. Thanks for coming back on, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Of course. So we just wanted to, to talk a little bit about the upcoming meet and the programs that you guys have. One of the ones that I thought was particularly interesting is the the specific incentive for the Illinois horsemen, because that's, you know, that's something that's a little bit up in the air right now where a lot of those Illinois guys and, and gals are going to run now that Arlington Park isn't there anymore. Have you been have you been in contact with people from Illinois racing? Is that, that why this program came about? Yeah, absolutely. And we'll see if there's um, more to come in that program in the coming weeks. But we have been talking with them closely and obviously trying to be respectful of the situation as well there. But, you know, understanding that there's kind of a significant void, at least in part of the summer uh, in the Midwest, trying to figure out creative programs that might be interesting to people that have historically raced in Illinois to stick in the Midwest was important to us this summer. So that's why you're seeing kind of the extra thousand dollar incentive uh, that we've put in place this year for horses that have previously run in Illinois. They come up to Minnesota this summer. Andrew, we've talked a lot about the takeout at Canterbury, and I want to bring it up again. Uh, the, the industry low 10 percent takeout on the pick five and pick sixes. Um, how is this how has this worked out for Canterbury? You know, you've had, I believe, is it two years now to assess this? Uh, if you could just say, you know, take a look back at, at, at the program, how it's worked for both Canterbury and for the betters. Sure. I mean, obviously, I think from the betters perspective, it's been super well received based on the feedback that we've seen and kind of the participation in those pools, uh, specifically the pick five over the last two years has really skyrocketed. You know, we have played around with a lot of different takeout changes over the years. And this one in particular was really uh, used as a promotional tool to get awareness to our product, understand, you know, at least when we started that at the beginning of COVID, we were running a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday schedule. We've changed that schedule somewhat now, but it was to get some uh, awareness to what our product was and what we were all about. And I think that it's certainly delivered when you look at our handle numbers over the past two meets, um, over 120% growth in that product. And I think that that's not solely attributable to the low takeout, but that's certainly been one of the tools that we've used to get attention to our product. And I think it's been super well received by the, by the betters across the country. Andrew, one of the things that I know um, a lot of fans uh, you know, have told us in the past that they love these boutique meets and they also love the fact that when racetracks kind of cluster together, a, a really big day of racing, um, you know, where you get three, four, five, six steak races in a day. And it just makes um, for a, a really good atmosphere. You have top horses there. And I've noticed when going through your stakes schedule that that's kind of what you've patterned, um, you know, your your stakes weekends around. Tell us a little bit about um, some of the upcoming big weekend steak weekends that you guys have coming up. Sure. Our biggest day of the year is always um, Mystic Lake Northern Stars Day with five or six stakes races. That'll be on Wednesday, June 22nd this year. And we've been, you know, grouping stakes kind of into those five or six uh, stakes days for probably the last five or six meets, trying to kind of focus our attention on those significant days at Canterbury. And it paid off specifically last year uh, with a record Canterbury Park record handle day. Uh, on that day. So we're looking forward to big things uh, to come again this year uh, on Wednesday, June 22nd. 
just wanted to ask a similar question to Bill, but, but going back to my question about the, the incentives, what kind of effect have you seen uh, on like field size, on the number of barns that are over there? What, what, yeah, like how, how well has that worked in terms of increasing the horse population? Sure. So we run several different incentive programs. One's a thousand dollar shipping bonus. For anybody that participates in May, we spoke uh, briefly about the Illinois bonus program. We also do some qualified shipping loan programs. And we see, you know, spikes in field size at the beginning of the meet as a result of those programs. And I think that that's important kind of as a seasonal meet, as a boutique meet, as a meet that still draws horses from, you know, several different racetracks across the country. We really don't have the benefit of that natural circuit that you see in some other places. So to start a meet strong with good field size, I think is very important to us as we kind of capture better's attention and, and get people's interest in our meet at the beginning and then try to hold it throughout the summer. So historically we've seen, you know, the benefit of that program is that the first several weeks of the meet, the average field size is usually close to a horse above, you know, what you see kind of throughout kind of that lull that occurs maybe in June before two-year-olds are ready, and then our meet typically picks back up again in July and finishes strong, usually throughout August and September. But, um, you know, with horses coming from five or six different racetracks, um, lengthy and expensive ships for a lot of those horses to get here, it's important for us to put things in place to make sure we start the meet strong. You know, I, th I think you guys do a lot of good stuff in terms of, of promotion. I think you get a lot of a lot of people out to the track. I think relative to other smaller, medium sized tracks, what's your attendance? What's your attendance like? And are, are there any things that you do to get regular, just you know, casual fans out to the track? Sure. Pre pre COVID, we averaged um, about sixty five hundred people a race card, and then obviously. You know, throughout COVID, that's changed a lot as we had to modify our business model substantially in year one. Last year, I think when we spoke, we were playing around with the schedule that was going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Sunday. And that was significantly successful in bringing some large crowds back to our facility on Sunday afternoons, kind of a more traditional time for them. And the added benefit for us is that we were able to hold on to the majority of our off-track handle um, on Sunday afternoons. So this year, we're playing around a little bit further um, and, and running a Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday night, Sunday afternoon program in hopes to kind of recapture maybe about the last 20% or so of that on-track business that that we lost um, over the last couple of years. So we're hopeful that we can bring back kind of a, a full complement of our on-track business and blend that with some of the success that we've seen off-track over the last couple of summers. Listen, and, and, and we'd love to see it. I, I really appreciate you guys. There's so, there's so much talk about the, the smaller and mid-level tracks that are kind of going by the wayside, but you have a revolutionary area idea, which is to try things, to try <laughs> things to get people to show up and bet on your, your track. And I think you guys are doing a terrific job. So, so thanks for coming on and talking to us. Andrew, best of luck with the meet, which starts May 18th. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, guys. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we are thrilled to bring on this week Hall of Fame jockey and an excellent TV analyst on the Fox Sports and Naira show, Gary Stevens. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, it's nice to finally be on here. I was supposed to have done it a couple of times. We're finally here, guys. Good to see you, man. I wanted to ask off the jump about Dwayne Lucas and Secret Oath, because obviously you have that shared history with him with winning colors. You know, he's never afraid to step outside the box. A, why do you think that is? Why do you think Dwayne is so willing to take these chances? And B, do you see any kind of similarities in the situations between Secret Oath and winning colors? Yeah, well, Wayne has never been afraid to jump outside the box. And I, I think, uh, in today's times with uh, a lot of negativity going around surrounding our industry right now and indecisiveness and whatnot, I think this is a, a feel good, feel good story. And Wayne has always been about this sport a hundred percent. He's the best ambassador that we've ever had for the sport. And if we have a czar, it's him. Um, and, uh, listen, the similarities, uh, two very good feelings, People have asked me, is she anything like winning colors? I, I actually think what I'm seeing in the mornings, um, she may be better than winning colors. Wow. Um, she's got a different style than winning colors. Uh, she can um, sit. She loves to sit off the pace and be a stalker and, and accelerate. She's got brilliant acceleration for a dirt horse, uh, almost like a turf horse. When she drops and, and puts in her kick, 
uh, she she gets it over with in a hurry. Uh, granted, she's been running against Phillies, but I think there's a lot more in the tank than than what we've seen. And just because he runs in the Arkansas Derby doesn't necessarily tie his hands into running in the Kentucky Derby. And he's well aware of that. He's got uh, Ethereal Road as well, headed for the bluegrass. So um, Wayne's always been a great decision maker. And like I said, he's not afraid to step out of the box. Gary, I wanted to stay on the same topic because it's so interesting. And obviously, as Joe uh, pointed out with you and winning colors and, and Lucas, you have a history there. But I want to ask you, you surprised me a little bit because I, I know what Wayne has said. But if, if the Philly wins the Arkansas Derby, I don't see any scenario where she doesn't go in the Kentucky Derby because that's Wayne. He <laughs> goes for it. I mean, he's never shy. I can't see him backing up and say, no, 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 we just beat all the boys. Now we're going to go for the Phillies. Am I maybe right about that in some extent? To some extent, I think, I think you're probably 100 <laughs> percent right. If she wins, if she wins the Arkansas Derby and, and she's healthy and and uh, continues to, to to thrive as she has, uh, I think we will see her the first Saturday in May. Uh, that's yet to be determined. Determined. Uh, she's going to have to run a powerful race, and I, I would say if she gets beat, and Ethereal Road should should happen to win the bluegrass stakes and he's going to have to think things out and decide what he wants to do. But um, listen, I, I think it's great for the sport. Uh, he's always been great for the sport. And uh, all these years later for this to be happening right now at this point in his career, it's a blessing. I, I see uh, Wayne's, I, I mean, when I hang out with him in the morning, just the two of us, uh, we, we talk about a little, lot of different things and um, but it's all been surrounding um, sacred oath, um, or secret oath since, um, you know, her, her last couple of victories, especially. You know, I wanted to stay on the, the topic of the Derby trail. Cause we, I, we talk a lot about the, the, the Kentucky Derby contenders on this show every week. Um, I think our consensus is that there's not one horse, one superstar that scares you right now is a lot of nice horses, but what, what is your, what are your impressions as we head into April on the three-year-old class this year? Well, I, I think that uh, Classic Causeway has caught my eye uh, the most. And, and I've followed him since uh, before he ever ran his first race. Uh, as you know, I was at uh, Churchill Downs uh, doing uh, Fox's America's Day at the Races all summer. Last summer, also hustling books for being an agent for Drayden Van Dyke. So I was riding, uh, you know, a handful of horses for Brian Lynch. And, and he had told me about this colt early on that he thought that, you know, he he was above average. He said he's something special. And I think that's the amazing part is when these horsemen, when these trainers are able to, um, you know, find these these babies that they know are special. They they see from the ground what I used to feel on a horse's back. And uh, it's a it's a pretty good feeling. And it's a great feeling of confidence that you have. I, I remember back. The first time that I rode Brocco, who I wound up winning the Breeders' Cup uh, Juvenile on, he went on and, and won the Santa Anita Derby and on to the Kentucky Derby, a, a rough trip. But I remember the first time I ever breezed him was uh, a half mile for Andy Winnick. And I came back and I, I said, I'm going to win the Breeders' Cup Juvenile on this horse. He said, dude, it's like May and we haven't <laughs> even started yet with this horse. He said, how, how are we going to do this? Well, it happened. And it's just you, you get that feeling. And I think that the, the top, top horsemen, uh, they can sense this as well and uh, sense it early on. And, and they've started that journey well before uh, any of us have ever heard of a horse like Classic Causeway. Gary, allow me to switch gears a little bit. And obviously, uh, you know, you're a jockey that's known throughout the country, but we still always think about you as a Southern California rider more so than any place else. Were you surprised by uh, the two jockeys, particularly Flavian Pratt and then Umberto Brispoglia as well, uh, saying they're pulling up stakes and coming east? No, I wasn't at all. Um, matter of fact, I I thought that this move would have come uh, a couple of years ago, to be quite honest with you. You've seen We've all seen the success that Flavian has had, uh, you know, when he's traveled to the uh, East Coast. Uh, Chad Brown always willing to uh, put him uh, put him on horses, uh, more than willing. Um, it seemed like he was kind of his go-to guy when, when he'd come out there. Look, 
he's he's climbing into what I consider the the toughest jo- jockey colony uh, possibly in the world. I'm not just going to say in uh, North America, but possibly the world. I mean, uh, you got the Ortiz brothers, uh, Manny Franco. I mean, the list goes on and on. I don't want to miss anybody, but uh, it's, and and I think that uh, Umberto, um also. Um, you know, you've got to think about the future, and and I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. We see uh, the numbers uh, in the smaller fields in in Southern California, and that's one reason I'm in Arkansas right now with Giovanni Franco and Tiago Pereira. Um, you know, very good riders that they were uh, sixth, seventh on on the list and of uh, people's choices, and when they're running, you know, shorter fields and and uh, multiple trainers have have multiple entries in these short fields, it doesn't, it doesn't live, leave a lot of crumbs for the rest. And granted, Flavian Pratt has completely dominated uh, over these past couple of years and people, why is he picking up? I, I think that he's making a long-term decision. Uh, he's got two young kids and, and uh, he's got to raise them. And um, I don't want to get into politics or anything uh, like that. Uh, with the state, but there's there's a reason that people are leaving California, and it's not always job related. You know, you brought up some of the jockeys in, in New York, and I agree with you that it's the strongest colony in the world. Um, you're kind of that that kind of thread between the the great riders of the '80s and the '90s and into the 2000s. You've seen so many of these guys ride at their at their peak, and, and you're obviously among the, the greats. But you know, I wonder if there's any kind of trend maybe that you've noticed over time any kind of way that the jockeys have either gotten more talented changed their riding style how would you compare this era right now with the ortizes and Luis Saez to some of the earlier uh, jockeys you rode with look i, I mean uh, angel cordero's the uh, lafitte pinkai's bill shoemaker eddie delahousse I, I mean again i don't want to forget anybody they were great great riders and i i'm proud that i was able to compete with the guys that i i was able to compete with and the mid eighties, all the way through the, the decades that you just mentioned. Uh, I, I believe that at that time, when I came around in California, it was, it, it was like the tide had kind of shifted from the East coast to the West coast. I won't say that we were dominant, but we were, we were strong. It was equally, equally strong. And I think we've seen that, that tide move back over, you know, the past, uh, 15 to 20 years to the dominance has, has come on the West coast. And I'm not taking anything away or to the East Coast. I, I'm not taking anything away from the West Coast jockeys. It, it all depends on opportunity. And if you're not getting an opportunity, you're not getting to ride races to approve upon yourself. Listen, when you got a group full of, of riders in a jockey's room going out competing with the best of the best every day, it makes you better. And as you get better, it's like any sport. Uh, we see these athletes, um, whether it's basketball, football, any sport you want to pick. Uh, we see these young kids that are doing um, Magic Johnson back in the day, uh, Jordan. And and they just I mean, they're repeating their moves as young kids trying to emulate these guys. And, and through that, they get better and better and better. And I, I think that, you know, I see a lot of. Uh, Angel Cordero in, in a lot of these jockeys. And, and from that, these young kids are, they're, they're emulating the Ortiz brothers and um, the uh, Tyler Gaffleones, uh, if you will. There's a lot of talent out there. And, um, you know, there, there are a lot more opportunities on the East Coast. From When you come to the other side of the Mississippi from, from California, there's a lot more racing opportunities than what there is if, than if you're on that island in California. And that's sort of what it's turned into. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gary, back to the Rispoli uh, Pratt thing. Uh, it's bad news for California racing, but it's going to be good news for somebody because there's an awful lot of wins out there just waiting for a jockey to pick them up. Uh, we have Juan Hernandez who's probably the most likely, but maybe is, is there anyone else? I mean, I know you hope it's your two riders and maybe it will be, but um, you know, when we're having this conversation this time next year, who's who's filled that void in California? Who do you see being you know, maybe not the new Flavian Pratt, because that's too much to ask. But, the you know, the person who really took advantage of this situation out there. Well, I, I think Juan will. Uh, obviously, uh, there's no question in my mind. Um, he, he was already, you know, um, getting to that position with the good cult of uh, forgive me 
right now with the good cult Richard Mandela is to, as Forbidden his, Kingdom. Yes, uh, unfortunately, he missed the work the other day, and hopefully that doesn't keep him out of the Santa Anita Derby. Hopefully everything gets all right there. But um, he's become the kind of go-to guy that when they couldn't get Pratt. And, and that's a little bit of what happened to me when I first went to Southern California as far as the Pinkeyes and Shoemaker and Delahousies and Holly and, and everybody. If you put yourself in a position that, that you've worked horses or whatever, and, and uh, uh, Flavian Pratt's, Pratt's got uh, multiple – options you became the go-to guy and once you rode and won that horse and they saw talent there you didn't lose them out you you kept building up momentum and that's what i see happening with with juan but uh there's going to be some guys step in um there there's talk that uh ramon vasquez is going out uh you know if california loves new faces and, and they love faces that have gone away for a while and come back but as far as my two jocks go right now, we, we don't anticipate in going back to, uh, to Southern California. Uh, that's not in the cards at this point in time. Interesting. Yeah, there's an incident I wanted to ask you about in the, uh, in the Fountain of Youth. I'm sure you saw it, the Paco Lopez incident where he, that horse came out and you had the two horses clip and stumble and lose their riders. Thankfully, everybody was OK. You know, Paco has a reputation for that kind of thing. He, as far as I know, he hasn't gotten suspended for that yet, but he has gotten suspended for careless riding in the past. Do you think that that's something that the Gulfstream stewards and maybe some other track officials need to come down harder on him so that stuff doesn't happen as much? Well, I, I think uh, that this is almost like like the little boy that cries wolf, um, you know, all the time, all the time. And all of a sudden you cry wolf and that there actually is a wolf. But my, my point here being. It's it's 2022. Where is our technology? Why do we not have a drone or something with an overhead shot? Because I did not see one angle that that proved him guilty of any foul. Uh, you know, when the incident happened, it, it was tight quarters and there wasn't room for any error. And I'm not sure that Junior Alvarado uh, wanted to be where he was at that point when when it happened. They, they were coming off of the turn. And there was not one angle that I saw where I could I could put blame on anybody. There was pressure on the outside. He he was holding his own ground. And and listen, I I watch these races and and uh, you know he's a very talented rider and and he cuts a fine line. And there's been some crashes and dangerous situations. But this particular uh, instance, I I can't put any blame on him uh, specifically. And I'm just I'm trying to be fair here. Uh, let's get some technology going where, where these stewards have better views than what they have. It's 2022. Gary, you're wearing many hats now, including your work on America's Day at the races on, on Fox Sports Network. And I've asked this to several people that we've had on from that show. Um, we're all wondering what's it doing for racing. And we know it's a good thing. No doubt about that. But. What kind of feedback have you heard? Do you think the show is creating new racing fans? And if so, you know, to what extent or what kind of impact has this had? So, you know, this is something that, you know, we used to have 10 hours a year of television for all the entire sport. Now we've got 10 hours a day, uh, thanks to Fox Sports and you guys. I, I think it's definitely uh, built new fans. And, you know, I hate to say it, but the pandemic, as uh, many Folks in the world that we lost, uh, you know, to to uh, COVID nineteen, uh, it could quite possibly have, have uh, helped horse racing in a big, big way. And I, not possibly, it did. And you know, we were the first game in in town that was that was able to uh, be broadcast a, a sport. You know, everybody shut down, and because of our outdoor and, and dealing with horses and stuff. We were able to continue on um, and bring bring horse racing into homes at, at, a, at a horrible, horrible time. And it looks like now we're, we're finally on our way out of this. Uh, everything's changing back. But during that time, I mean, look, I, I, I click on Fox Sports to see what's on all the time. And, and um, you know, there's a lot of young people that, that love other sports and we were the only sport there and all of a sudden they're watching and they're seeing there's, you know, we can't get any action on uh, basketball, football, or anything else right now. Why don't we bet on some horses and learn about this game a little bit? 
And I think that we've done a really good job, you know, toning down things, not dummying up uh, the, the game, but trying to explain things as, as best we can to the new viewers. And, and we're constantly reminded that from our producers and, and uh, Tony Alivato, Eric Donovan, uh, all of our staff, uh, look, just make this appreciable to the people that don't understand the game. And, and for the people out there that understand the game, like you all do, and, and the breeders, owners uh, throughout the country that do watch our show, that's the reason we speak sometimes as we do, uh, just so we know that we've constantly got new viewers coming in and we want to keep growing. Uh, not only uh, it, me personally, I want to just keep growing the sport, period. Yeah. And I think you guys do a great job of straddling that line between not being too complicated, not dumbing it down too much. Another thing I like about that show is you have a diverse array of expert voices. You obviously have you who has been a Hall of Fame jockey. You have Maggie down the paddock examining the horse flesh. You have the handicappers like Andy and Jonathan. I wonder if there's anything that maybe you have learned from sitting in that different perspective and working with all of those, you know, that array of people who know a, a lot of stuff about the, the game from different perspectives. Yeah, and, and uh, also Richie Migliore, you know, who, who I have great respect for. And uh, we, we think a lot alike, but uh, I think it's, it's like I was talking about, um, you know, when we had such a diverse and, and great jockey room in, in California uh, for so long, when I, during my growing years, uh, it can only make you better. And I, we have a team that we, I, I think, strive to make each other better, and we do make each other better. And I think we all respect each other's opinions. Yeah, me and Andy, we, we have our moments, but uh, it's, it's all good when, uh, when the camera's off. And it's not fair. I get, I get rattled a little bit. Andy's got himself a little, little bit of uh, attitude, too, you know. But uh, oh, I, think Andy. <laughs> I think we all compliment each other, hopefully. And uh, I, I, I get a lot of feedback through social media. Some of it, you know, I ignore and, and whatnot. But... Uh, it's a great team and, and I'm just appreciative that, that I'm there. So with that, you got to check out the Fox sports TV show. If you haven't seen it already, Gary's great on it. Everybody's great on it. And it really brings you to the track on those days where you might not be able to make it, especially at Saratoga. Gary Stevens, thank you so much for coming on and talking to Thanks, us. Man. Gary. Good thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the time. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Gary Stevens will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. The XBTV Workout of the Week this week features a pair of Kenny McPeak, Kentucky Derby hopefuls, as we're seeing right now, rattle and roll and smile happy, worked in company on March 19th at Gulfstream, going five furlongs in a very swift 58.81. Kenny hasn't decided yet for smile happy where he's going to go, either in the bluegrass or in the Florida Derby. The rattle and roll, as we're going to talk about in a little bit, is aiming for the grade two Louisiana Derby this Saturday at Fairgrounds. And as always, you want to see those workouts as we ratchet up and get closer to the Derby, you can go to xbtv.com to search the horse. Most likely they'll have it. they got a great, great repository of all those works. Go check it out. So we're actually going to talk about some racing now. There's uh, some decent racing this weekend, better than decent. We've got the Fairgrounds uh, Louisiana Derby card, which is a, a great stakes-laden card. They have four graded races. 
Um, five stakes overall. We made all stakes pick five. And then we have the Dubai World Cup on Saturday as well. We're going to we're gonna get to both. Uh, just wanted to get some thoughts from the guys about what they're looking forward to on the Louisiana Derby card. I think I'm going to steal it and say Echo Zulu. I feel like you guys are going to say Echo Zulu too. I'm sorry, Job. I'm bad. I couldn't help it. What do you That's think? my new Camine. That's my new Camine, um, for God's sake. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. I mean, the funny thing about the Louisiana Derby, Joe, is it's not as good a race as the prep, the Risen Star, because the Risen Star included Zandon and Smile Happy, who are both going in opposite direction or in other directions. Um, so, you know, Epicenter has a an easier task in like this race. Uh, I mean, it's a way know, better it, race than the Risen Star. Yeah, uh, you know, which is when do you ever see that? I mean, he should probably win again, I would imagine. I, I don't know exactly what he, he's going to prove in this if he goes out there. And yeah, I mean, in, at the risk of just duplicating what you said. But to me, the story of the day is Echo Zulu. Uh, you know, Steve Asmussen is, is, is some, something unusual here. He's only given her one prep. For the Kentucky Oaks, most trainers will give the horses at least two. He's been, you know, she's really been under the radar. She comes in here ready to go. And, you know, the thing is, we don't always see three-year-olds make that transition from two to three. It trips some of these horses up. Is she going to come back as good or maybe even better as she was last year? You know, because she was a filly, she got a little bit overshadowed by the Colts and everything and, and uh, um in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile and whatnot in Corniche, but she was absolutely phenomenal last year. And the other thing, too, is, you know, that kind of plays into because I'm interested, this whole story of Secret Oath, which we haven't talked about uh, today, but could, if Echo Zulu comes back and just wins by the length of the stretch, gets 104 buyer or something like that, could it be more difficult for Secret Oath to beat Echo Zulu in the Oaks or to win the Kentucky Derby? That's actually a conversation worth having. If, in fact, Echo Zulu comes back and runs the kind of race that I think works. Well, well, not to pat myself on the back, but I will say that if you go back to last week's show, somebody, one of the three of us said that the three-year-old Philly group was actually deeper than the three-year-old Colt group. Was it Was it Joe Bianca? No. Was, did Vivian Hernandez mention it in Bill Finley's <laughs> scathing article? No. Oh, it was me. It was me. It was me. Yes. Um, so I'm very excited to see Echo Zulu come back, you know, make her 2022 debut undefeated. And uh, just looked like the class of the field last year. But I'll tell you what, guys, there are a couple of Phillies in here that I wouldn't be surprised that could that could give her a race. Um, Sequist, who is owned by our our friends over at West Point Thoroughbred, oh, um, I think is a, a legitimate Philly as well. And then there's a sneaky horse in there, Hidden Connection on the outside, that is owned by uh, by our friends at, at Hidden Brook, uh, you know, Farm and trained by Brett Calhoun, who ran a very sneaky race last time in the Rachel Alexandra and just got tired and faded to fourth after uh, setting the pace in, in that race. And I really feel like that was her tightener. So, you know, she may have needed that one, but let's not, let's not be you know silly. I mean, Echo Zulu is still the class of the field and certainly from the one hole should go right to the front and, and probably improve from there. Um, at least that that's what everyone is hoping for, because I would love to see a hundred percent Echo Zulu coming into um, Derby weekend, whether the Oaks or the Derby um, doesn't matter, but coming in and, and being cranked up and ready to go a hundred percent, um, you know, for for that weekend. Um, I'm also interested in, in watching the fairgrounds. I know fairgrounds, uh, excuse me, the Louisiana Derby at the fairgrounds. I know it's not as good of a race as the previous one um, or even, you know, the LeCompte for that matter. Uh, but there are nine horses in the race, four of which are represented in our contest. Um, but even more importantly, six of them, guys, six of them were Keeneland graduates, um, you know, that, that went through the sales, at, the various sales at Keeneland and, and are now showing up in this um, you know, legitimate derby prep. So to me, that that's also of, of great interest. Proxy is is running um, in the New Orleans Classic, the Grade Two, which I think is going to be exciting to see him come back. Uh, you know, we're we're fans of of, uh, of Michael Stidham, so I want to see you know that horse run really really well. And then the other derby prep that we haven't mentioned yet is the Sunland Park Derby, which is you know for fifty, it's a fifty point race. Um, you know, and Slow Down Andy, which was on my stable group. Um, is the two to one favorite in that for Doug O'Neill and uh, looks to hopefully pick up the 50 points and get me back into the race of our contest. Because at the end of the day, that is the most important thing we talk about. Of course, of course. And, you know, if, if, if slow down, down Andy can't take you to the promised land, John, I think you might be a little assed out, as, as we say in Brooklyn. Um, just other, other, other action. As John mentioned, there's four horses in the uh, Louisiana Derby that are, are part of our team's. 
Uh, Al's got a, a duo in there, uncoupled entry of Zozos and uh, Rattle and Roll. Sue's got Pioneer and Madonna, uh, Madonna, Pioneer and Medina on her on her leftovers team, and of course Bill has got Epicenter, who's carried him to first place so far. I, I misspoke earlier. There's eight stakes, eight stakes races at Fairgrounds on Saturday. Uh, three of them are Louisiana bred, and then we have five open stakes to close the card. And then overseas, we got the Dubai World Cup. Actually, a monster card with a ton of money uh, up for grabs. Uh, some some pretty good American participation, not just in the Dubai World Cup. Uh, just going to run down a couple of uh, other notable horses that are running before we get to the big race. We got Yubir, who was named uh, champion turf male in America after his Breeders' Cup uh, turf win last year. He's going to be in the Shima Classic. Big, big, strong looking field in that race. Um, the, the Dubai turf has Colonel Liam. We talked to Todd Fletcher recently about, about him going there and he did get on the, on the flight with life is good. Uh, Dr. Shai, Dr. Shival in the Dubai golden Shaheen also ever fast drain the clock, uh, strong constitution for Doug O'Neill, Switzerland, who used to be an American horse and has really taken over, um, in, in, in the middle East wonder where Craig is, who's a, a mid Atlantic based horse. So we got a lot of us horses in the golden Shaheen. In the Alpo Sprint, we've got Casa Creed, who I'm a fan of, Get Smoking as well. Um, let's see, what else we got? The UAE Derby, Pinehurst. Bill was mentioning this this off air that this is Pine, this would be Pinehurst's last chance, basically, to, to accrue points for the Derby, but he's still trained by Bob Baffert, so it doesn't look like, look like that's going to happen. And in the Good Alpha Mile, shout out to New York Bread Banquet for Steve Asmussen and uh, uh, Winchell Thoroughbreds and Willis Horton Racing, son of Central Banker, who's going to be in the Godolphin Mile. But obviously, all eyes are going to be on Life is Good in the Dubai World Cup. It's an 11-horse field going a mile and a quarter. That's the big question with him. I haven't looked at the, the PP specifically to see if there's any other speed. I can't imagine there's someone that's going to want to run with Life is Good early. I think most people are going to try to take back and hope that that last furlong does him in. He was slowing down a little bit at the end of the Pegasus, but you can always have that debate about whether or not Irad was easing up on him. Him or he was getting tired. Uh, what what are your what are your guys' predictions? Do you think we're going to see life is good? Have that powerful powerful performance that he had in the Pegasus and the Breeders' Cup? Uh, yeah, I don't see why we wouldn't, Joe. And uh, you know, this is a, a a good race, especially you know, Hot Rod Charlie's the new one to the mix in here after the Saudi Cup. But you know, after he thrashed the Horse of the Year, Nick's Go in the Pegasus World Cup, you know, I don't think there gets to be much bigger of a test than that. You know, I would I'm looking at this race more as a, as a fan than as a better or anything else. You, you know, we're, we're we think this horse is really really special, and you know, unfortunately, in this day and age, we're probably going to get to see him run for. Or three, four more times. So let's just enjoy it when he go, does go out there. And uh, you know, I I would be disappointed if if not only didn't he, that if he lost, but I would be disappointed if he didn't win decisively by four or five lengths. Because you know, the, and the, the hype I think is real with this horse, and I'd like to see him go out and prove it again. The mile and a quarter is going to be tough. The mile and a quarter is going to be tough, and the fact that he had the ship, you know, ar around the world. But yeah, dollar for dollar, he's he's the best horse in, in the you know in the country, if not. In the world, and that's what he's trying to prove. Um, Joe, you, you know, you made me chuckle before when when you were talking about um, how this horse jumped on the plane and and you came over to you know overseas. I know when I'm on when I'm on a plane flying commercial, um, you know that that, uh, that I'm always watching the aisle and and like handicapping who you know who I want to have sit next to me. Do you think like life is good with sitting in there on the plane going? Oh, please don't let Bankit. Come on, don't let Bankit say, oh, no, come on, Pinehurst. We want Pinehurst. We want, you, you think like, like the horse was like handicapping and hoping to see who's going to be, you know, traveling next to him on the, on well, the maybe flight. Maybe like a snorer. He's, he's right, a exactly. <laughs> exactly. Do you guys do that also when you're on when you're on planes? Do you like handicap the seat? Well, I don't like, know if you know this, John, but on commercial flights, they, they assign you seats. They give you the seats. It's not just a free for John hasn't flown commercial in so long. He forgot how it worked. They don't just open the plane doors and everybody first come, first serve. They give you a seat. So, right. But, but you don't know if you're not traveling with somebody, you don't know who that empty seat next to you is going to be filled by. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's and what I'm when, saying. You, when they come down to aisle, you're like, please not him. Please not yeah, him. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. please, please not the guy with the open container of food or, you know, or please don't have the, the you know, please don't have Bill Finley sit next to me because the plane's going to get struck by lightning. Please, thanks, John. You know? I re Bill, you probably remember this. Remember People's Express? Sure, okay. of course. Yeah. So, Joe, there was an airline called People's Express, and it was literally twenty nine dollars to fly basically anywhere on the East Coast. But the twenty nine dollars only got you the actual bottom of the seat, 
you had to pay extra for like the back of the seat, for the air you breathe, for like any. And what they would do is like everything was like a one up charge. And depending on what you wanted to buy or spend, you know, you could you could like get a fancier seat or a better part of the seat. Or, but it would be like a cattle, you know, charge when they opened the gate. They would basically literally say, everyone who is on flight 28 to Newark, please come to gate 52. Like you didn't know what gate it was either. It was kind of like Russian roulette. And everyone would like run to the gate and stand in line. And then you would jump in whatever seat you wanted to. And that was like the first really big, you know, way of, of flying uh, no frills was People's Express. Um, and they would literally come down the aisle way with a credit card machine, with like the old fashioned credit card receipt machine. And you would ha- you would pay for the flight before they took off. They would take everyone's money because they would they would basically be like, oh, OK, you're breathing air. So that's another twenty eight dollars. And you have a bag that is overhead. So we're going to charge you an overhead fee. Um, and, but and that was like that was People's Express. Remember that, Bill? No, absolutely. Well, a lot of airlines do that now where it's like, oh, you wanted to take a bag with you. Well, right. that's going to be another 50 bucks. I didn't we didn't know people wanted to travel with a bag. This is like the hackiest thing ever. What's the deal with airline food? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's been a good show. We're rolling. So might as well get all, go with it. Go with it. Get all of our grievances out now. The Festivus. Festivus. You know, I got a lot of problems with you people. <laughs> now you're going to you, Kruger. <laughs> The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. You can learn more at westpointtb.com. It was great to talk to Terry Finley last week ahead of OBS March. They came out of the OBS March sale with 12, a full dozen new two-year-olds. You can go on their website now, westpointtb.com, and check out their latest availability. They have a Bernardini cult and a Practical Joke cult, both going to John Sadler. Collected cult going to Sher- Sherita Vo. Motown cult going to Steve Asmussen and a, P- a Peace and Justice Philly, who we mentioned earlier in the, in the PA bread spot, heading to Christoph Clement. So West Point, always very diverse with the trainers they give horses to. I think that's a, that's always a, a good call because then you don't get put on the shelf like, other, like, you know, if you have a ton, ton of horses with one trainer, there are some horses that might not be able to get on the track. You might be competing with yourself a little bit. So shout out to Terry and all the partners at West Point for a very successful, we'll say, uh, OBS March. Got a lot of horses, got new horses in the barn, and we look forward to seeing all those two-year-olds on the track. And we'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way when it comes to being at the sales ground showing your horses we are with your horse just driving up down the road every day there's not a time that i don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport the animal the people that come to invest in the game i want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. At the OBS March sale, Colt by More Spirit sold for $700,000, bred by Brad King. He was the third highest priced More Spirit yearling last year when he went through the Legacy consignment for $160,000. Great job, great prep work by Legacy on, on, on that front. And so far in 2022, Legacy is responsible for 50 winners. We're up to 50 now with earnings of $1.6 million. Shout out to Tommy and Wendy and the whole team at Legacy. Always doing a great job. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. A reminder to get those entries in for the Keeneland April Horses of Racing Age sale. The sale is April 29th. The entry deadline is April 1st, which is next Friday. And that is one week away from the start of the Keeneland Spring Meet. Cannot wait. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our excellent Green Group guest of the week, Gary Stevens, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, producer Katie Petruniak, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson, Thank you all so much for watching. See you next week.